What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Rock and Roll Gypsy Diaries. I'm your host, Andy Thunders, and here with me today, I've got the legendary Dean Kramer, who is from Funny Money, So Low, and so much more. How are you, man? I am doing well. How are you doing? I'm I love you. I love your hat. I like your hat way more than I like my hat. Thank you. Man. There's a style. Mine has convenience. <laughs> I just picked it up one day. My wife got it for me from Spirit Halloween, and everybody seems to like it. So I just yeah. kept it. I it's, thank it's you. Um, you know, like I said, it's an honor. Obviously, funny money, legendary, at least from my area, because I'm from York, Pennsylvania originally, and I'm a upstate New York transplant. Um, what started your musical journey, though, if we can go back in time? What was like your moment where you realized that's what I want to do? I want to play guitar in a rock band. Um, take it all the way back as, as far as I can at least literally recall would be <laughs> uh, the Osmonds. Actually, in the very basically about the beginning of the 70s, they were probably the biggest thing on the planet about probably around 1970. And mm. my brother and I were both into it. So at the time, uh, fair warning, I was probably like four, maybe five. Uh, but they had a record come out called Phase Three. And there's one that had Down by the Lazy River on it. And uh, I think Yo-Yo was also on that. And anyway, yeah. just a top to bottom great record. So anyway, uh, that's really got, got me into it. So by the time the 70s were rolling and everything, uh, I, was, I was just completely full into music, always wanting to sing. And eventually I wanted to go ahead and be a drummer by the time Kiss came rolling out. So uh, <laughs> my brother and I uh, got into Kiss probably around 75. And um, nice, right at that right time. That was the it, perfect it, time because they were about to freaking explode. It, exactly. And, you know, so so I, if I was like nine or 10, of course, at, at the time, then, you know, you, you didn't know anything about it, but it was one of those uh, Columbia Record Clubs where, oh, wow. where we had. Uh, but my older my older sister she decided to go and do it and it back whenever you get four for a dollar or four for 99 cents or a penny whatever it was i remember time. the 90s version of that as a 90s kid those catalogs will come in the mail and i'd google at the guns and roses or the rock section i didn't care about anything else oh yeah why well, well, exactly yeah there, there's a lot you start to sift through everything that uh, is going to float your boat right so yeah so well, my sister decided to go ahead and join that. And she took the, she took Barry Manilow. I think it was Barry Manilow 2 as the blue album. I took Bay City Rollers Dedication. Okay. Uh, and then my brother uh, saw this cover and asked my sister, it's like, hey, you got two selections left. Do you care if I use both of them for this double album, which was Kiss a lot. Oh, so uh, that's actually how it, it really all kind of started. So it's funny, uh, like we said before we started filming, my introduction to music at age five was Kiss Alive 3, yeah. right in 96, right as the reunion happened. So it was kind of yeah. funny how that, how, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well, it is true. And of course, at the time, you know, I mean, I wasn't playing, uh, even though I guess I was interested, but maybe it's like, so that was kind of the thing, the Osmonds. And, you know, of course, I dug everything else back then, uh, Elton John and whatnot like that. Oh, yeah. Um, but but then eventually it became like, hey, I want to be a drummer, and probably yeah, maybe after seeing Kiss and Peter Chris, all that stuff. Oh, so, I'm sure. I mean, oh yeah. Well, everything doesn't matter about his it. level of skill, the amount of theatrics, and I, his swing back then was unbeatable. Like that's half of the magic was his swing, the way he made. Oh, yeah. Well, well, there's no doubt that they Kiss. You know, it's those four guys. That's the that's the kiss that everybody you know loves looks back to all that kind of stuff you know certainly no slight towards the other guys but you know absolutely the, original not. Stuff, the original stuff's the best you know that just tends to be that way it was funny because at the time of the reunion my, my dad would keep saying well you know dad who's playing guitar that's ace i'm like but dad the tape says bruce and they're not wearing makeup <laughs> like when i first listened to them i didn't know what they looked like it was in right. the truck with my dad when he played softball for his work yeah and we would listen to Judas Priest or, but I remember Kiss Alive 3 was always on the disc changer in his blazer. And it just, I don't know, it enraptured me as a kid. Like I, ever since I was a kid, I would envision what they were singing about. I would listen to every detail. What's that sound, dad? Like inquisitive. 
and it never stopped from there. Well, well, wait, so you went backwards. You, your exposure was alive three. Yeah. And then you went backwards and realized, hey, Gene yeah, my dad got me eight. destroyer. OK. And and, and you not know when I found were- out that Ace saying shock me, I wanted alive, too. And I remember constantly every time we went to the mall, dad, can I get that double cassette of alive, too? I'm not paying $15 for a cassette when you can get a CD for 25, <laughs> you know, back That's in true. those days yeah. before the internet, before this was before that, this is like 97, 98, before it really took off. Well, well, that's fine. So you can imagine if you went, you took that back instead of like 97, you went back to 77. Exactly. So yeah, and it's only- weird that Kiss did the reunion tour at that time. Yeah, as well. So it was almost like I got to relive a certain weird, almost quasi seventies version in a way because oh, I saw the go, farewell tour. Did you go to the convention? No, we, I we, was. We went to the Pittsburgh convention, the last one that they added, uh, and we we went there as best best hundred hundred bucks. I Ever wish had. I was too young, and my dad for some reason either didn't know about them or didn't do them. Yeah. Um, but I did get to see the original lineup for my first concert in 2000 on the farewell tour with Ted Nugent opening. I was 10. Yeah. I was nice. 10. You know, where, where, where did you see him at? We Hershey saw him Park. In, uh, Hershey. Oh, Hershey. I yeah, saw him there. You were there. I was there. I didn't see you and you probably didn't see me. But yeah, no, I was 10. But yeah, I, um, you know, I remember the T-shirt I got, which I've lost in a move somewhere, which I wish I still had. Cause it had the quote from the Seattle paper, which I'm friends with people who knew that writer who were at the same show. They're like, he's talking out his ass. Everybody was mind blown by kiss in 75. We had never seen anything like it back then. Yeah. You know, cause people started going to Seattle eventually towards the early eighties. And that's why the evil G word started to form. Cause all these kids that are rain soaked town, nothing to do, but play music. <laughs> you uh, know? Yeah. Well, it's funny though that you you brought up that that old uh, review of somebody. I literally sat on my my downstairs uh, steps last night, and I, I have a little clip that I I got from somewhere. I'm sure eBay somewhere along the line, but it it was uh, you know about that big, and it was a review from February first of seventy five, and it was uh at the Santa Monica Civic Arena oh, wow. or Auditorium, and, yeah. and you know and and so it's got like probably four or five paragraphs and jojo gunn was headlining it and their their last thing you know they had the last everything down there was kiss and they say so by the time jojo gunn came out you know kiss had blown up everything or super loud <laughs> they kind of really had nothing they were like uh you know don't follow these guys anymore so <laughs> yeah again yeah that the whole kiss thing but they but yeah they they were absolutely you know paramount in you know, I was already into music, and again, uh, but they they definitely you know they kind of just open up stuff. I mean, I don't know how many times I opened up Kiss Alive and and looked at read those letters and looked at oh, those yeah. pages, and and they they were superhumans. You know, there's no. I, I've I've got a German pressing of Alive on vinyl, uh, one of the reissues that they put out because for some mm-hmm. reason in my record collection, as I've lost some and had to rebuild over the years, I didn't have a copy of Alive. And when they started selling them, I'm like, I'll grab a German pressing because I don't have any German pressings. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'm not a completist, but I figured, well, you know, it's affordable. I'll grab it. You know, well, plus I I don't care. Everybody needs a copy of Alive. Exactly. Record collection, no matter what. It's just, it is all that to this day. So I've been listening to it for this long and I can put it on and I still go, this is just still all that. Oh yeah. You know? And I love going back and listening to those first three records too, because mm-hmm. as much as the, they always say the production is plagued. I love each album for its different quirks and the production. And that kind of makes those records. I had hotter than hell. And when I was nine and had a black Squire Strat, which is funny because I was a Gibson guy back then, but I have a Seafoam Squire Strat now. And there you go. It's my go-to guitar, because I love it, because no matter how much you put distortion on it, it still has that crunchy rock and roll organic tone. Yeah. And I was learning how to solo to let me go rock and roll on that black 
Fender Strat I beat the crap out of at nine years old, not knowing how to appreciate a damn thing, you know? Uh, Use a nickel. Let's get rock and roll, Grace. <laughs> yeah. Those solos, that's how I learned how to, like, I guess that was my beginning of, that's what I want to be able to do. So let me try to play along. And I could, I didn't know any chords. I didn't yeah. know the power chord. I didn't know what yeah. I was doing, but I'm like, if I want to get anywhere, I might as well listen to my favorite guitarist. Freaking oh yeah. Yeah. Ace, Ace was huge, huge uh, till this day. I've, I mean, I've, uh, I haven't yeah. realized how much they influenced me until I started working on an old song that I completely rewrote lyrically. I'm like, this is a very punky, almost cold gin, punk rock fusion type of sounding song. And I didn't realize it until I went back and listened to all the old Kiss stuff. I'm like, they influenced me in so many subliminal ways that I can't escape no matter if I wanted to. You know? Well, and they were also, just like our earlier conversation, um, you know, those 70s bands, you know. All of them has that Queen, quality. Aerosmith. Yeah, they, they all have, again, they're all unique and they sound a, a certain certain way. And for me, it's tough. And even as a guitar player, you know, I, I love I love Ace and sure you can do, you know, the little. Uh, yeah. You know, you can do that. Those typical Ace stuff. The uh, bends. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah just, I just, love again, how he yeah, bend a, a G chord on Shock Me. Oh yeah, that's Absolutely. so fucking dirty, and I've never heard anyone else really do that like that. You yeah, know? I, I use it all the time whether I'm playing electric or acoustic. I don't care. Yeah, yeah and of course, especially when very... I'm an E, I'll, I'll do that half bend to the G and just bend that. You know, oh yeah, there you go, just to make it cool. You know, like a yeah. hammer on type thing in a way sometimes. Yeah, you know, been, I, I, you know, I love this... that movement from E to that half G there. I don't know yeah. why. It's just so easy to start a song off with that. Well, there it's you go. Simple, you, stupid. You answered your own query. You're like, why is that cool? Oh, because it's easy and it sounds great. That's all that matters. It's, it's so versatile. Yeah. You can add yeah. it to almost anything to give it an extra oomph. Man. Make a note, man. Yeah, but, it, but it's true, though. Those, those guys, even whenever, you know, as a guitarist, um, you know, I mean, I love Eddie Van Halen, you know, uh, Brian May, Jeff Adams from the band Face Dancer out of Baltimore. Oh, huge, yeah. Huge fan of his. There was and, um, so much stuff that I was influenced by as a kid. I loved David Gilmour. I loved Jimmy Page. I loved, um, you know, Jeff Beck and the Yardbirds. I loved John Lennon's voice. I, I was drawn to his voice always. Um, mm. and there's so much different stuff that I always think of when I'm trying to write something or play guitar, there's always some kind of angle. I love Joe Perry and Brad Whitford on the seventies records. They were just, I love Sylvain Sylvain and Johnny Thunders, obviously, right. you know, um, I, I love hearing the interplay and in my own stuff, I always make, if there's a rhythm guitar track, it's always a different sounding guitar tone i use a different distortion and a different playing style so that way it doesn't sound like the same guitar you sure know what i mean because i love uh, that interplay there's so yeah. many different little things that each of those people did that i think as guitar players we kind of take and use in our own way because i loved randy rhodes and i can't do anything near him but i love cc deville and tracy guns too right and i love well, that Cobain and a lot of you know raw sounding guitarists that really weren't technically proficient but it's what they did with it you know oh, it, at the end of the day it, it's music and wh whether it's fancy or if it's bare bones you know all that matters is whether you like it and stuff yeah and, you know now, now granted it's one of those things where uh whenever i go to uh tim, tim pierce yeah. who played you know with rick springfield that's actually how i got exposed to him because i love rick springfield so yeah. to hear all of his great little things that he would do. And of course, you know, he's played with a you know, ton of people, recorded with a ton of people uh, at this point and stuff like that. So amazing. But but it's a matter of taking those guys. And yeah, if you take a little snippet of Brian May and Jeff Adams and <laughs> Ace really, whatever I got, you know, but, but you're going to find all that stuff. And if you keep, I guess, kind of keep playing it, doing it long enough, and it's where your head and your heart's at for your life, I guess at yeah. the end of the day, 
yet you end up with a little bit more of hey you know here's you because you took a little bit of everything else but but at the end of the day yeah because if i want to go ahead and play ed as soon as i as soon as i do that everybody goes eddie van halen which is exactly why i don't do that yeah because and i haven't found another way to incorporate you know kind of the real technique that didn't make me feel like i was just doing a second second rate ed you know yeah. what i mean so and and it's tough there's some people Randy Rose is kind of like that again, Ace Freely. Uh, you know, the, these guys, it's almost like if you play, you almost have to play their licks to play a lick that sounds like something that they would have played as goofy as that sounds. So yeah. it's almost like, I, I can't think of a Randy Rhodes lick that Randy Rhodes kind of didn't already play that makes me go, that sounds just like a Randy Rhodes lick, but he never played it that I heard, you know? Yeah. Or Eddie Van Halen, again, you know, you just hear the certain things that are just make those guys. And that's why it's tough and why, you know, you can name, you know, five, five, maybe 10 different guitar players that whenever you hear them, you go, I think I know who that is right out the gate. It's yeah. very tough. There's a ton of, you know, there's a crap ton of great guitar players out there who could even play, you know, rings around those guys. But, but even like Jimmy Page. So he did, he definitely did some great solo work. Right. But oh, for yeah. me, for me, it's all about, you know, his arranging and his production. Oh, yeah. It's you all know, his I mean, stuff it's all writing, you know? that he had yeah. every single part of. Yeah. I mean, No Quarter, hands down to me, is one of my favorite all-time songs ever. Yeah. And the mood and the ambience and the heaviness and the atmosphere and everything else just, ugh. I love when music gives you that chill up your spine. Yeah. You and, and, and you don't know what it is, even as a songwriter, you know how it is, you like, I mean, what you know, makes I, I, a song tick? I don't know. <laughs> well, well, exactly. That's what I was getting ready to say. It's like if anybody Everything's asks where the stuff comes from, who knows? I mean, unless again, you're trying to rewrite something, you know, based off of something intentionally. I, I've done that before. Oh, I've taken tempos. I yeah. go, hey, I want a song that's at this tempo. Well, because Paul Stanley did that with Firehouse. It was inspired by a move song called Fire Brigade. The concept of a girl so hot, you have to call the fire department. There you go. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure it doesn't sound like the original idea. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you know, play it backwards. <laughs> there, there was a guy who, uh, who I've done some stuff with in, in the past. And uh, he, I, 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 won't, I won't reference it too deep because I, I don't want anybody to tie the, tie the uh, two together. But basically it was that, you know, in, he loved a couple uh, other singer songwriters and stuff. So he would, unintentionally like he was a nice enough guy that I knew he wasn't intentionally doing it but he would basically take some of their songs and kind of rewrite them like saying <laughs> maybe even phrasing wise I'm like dude you can't do that because it's it's like that so if I if I can go ahead and immediately pick it up and go hey I know what song that is because I happen to know you know you love that love that singer and, and I happen to like that band too I was like dude that's that song with just yeah. different words and and he just might look at me and I'm like, but you can't do that, you know. But I yeah. did say all you have to do is instead of playing uh, EDA, you know, do it in reverse. You there know, you, it, it, yeah. it, you can keep the same words, but it's going to make you change the melody so your melody isn't following the same thing. Yeah, all you need is that one little thing or an extra chord in there, whatever. Yeah, There's kind of one also. thing that I don't know if you've ever thought of or if you know all these three songs consecutively. I know you'll know at least two. I don't know how they got away with it. Dead Flowers by The Stones, Used to Love Her by Guns N' Roses, and Ball and Chain by Social Distortion. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. They're James the same Ford. exact song. Yeah, absolutely. Same exact song, same exact chord progression, same exact melody, and yeah. Ball and Chain and Dead Flowers have the same tempo. Uh, so yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with all three have played all three of them. And uh, yeah, but, but I never made that connection, which is funny. <laughs> but I did. Yeah, well, I, I, I I don't know why I picked up on it. I'm just like, this is dead flowers. This is dead flowers. This is dead flowers. And I heard uh, dead flowers last. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but ball and chains more. Uh, the original version with those guys is actually more uh, rock, right? Guitars, or, or is it more uh, lighter guitar? It, it's a combination of acoustic with electric over top, but it's not heavy, dirty electric, like stuff okay. on like Don't Drag Me Down or Mommy's Little Monster. They're not fully overdriven. 
Okay. Okay. So they are, again, still pretty darn similar. Yeah. Kind of more like a brown tone. uh, Yeah. Like that. Okay. Kind of like that. A little bit of buzz, but not quite as clean as the stones. But yeah. I got you. Well, social D, you never know what you get, Mr. Oh, yeah. Just Um, three. That three chords in the truth stuff, right? Hey, nothing wrong with it. It's been practiced many times and you can't go wrong. Yep. Sometimes yeah. the simplicity is the genius. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, we, we all can't write Bohemian Rhapsody. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, or Shine on You Crazy Diamond, parts one through nine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's what's, uh, of course, making it cool. Pink Floyd. Now, there you go. So there's a band that growing up wise, I only ever had Dark Side and The Wall, you know? And uh, and I thought I both Piper great at records. 14, and that's what I was learning to play bass to. Piper at the Gates of Dawn, the first Pink Floyd record with Sid Barrett. And I was playing along to the Sex Pistols debut, and I learned how to play them front to back from tabs. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean, Sex t- Sex Pistols debut and only record? Yeah, never mind the bollocks. Very Unless first you count last. the great rock and roll swindle. But wow. that had some stuff sung by Sid and some stuff sung by Steve. That's right. a fun well, record. Well, exactly. You know, which again, you know, uh, it's w- whether it's uh, I don't even think I've it was heard a that. cash grab. <laughs> well, all you have to do is listen Not to John Rod. Like, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, the name says it all. You know, they, that's how funny is that? Like, that's, we're not even going to try to hide it. We're just yeah, trying to exactly. You got to respect them for that. You know? <laughs> and uh, silly thing, the uh, one song on there that only has Steve and Paul which are the, some of that stuff is really good stuff that, you know, people don't talk about much anymore. Um, Silly thing was about the whole thing that happened with the band. And apparently the original title was a lot more offensive than thing. It's a certain C word. They throw around in England a lot more in other places than we do over here. Uh, Yeah. Well, you know, they're they're just, uh, I I don't know. It's the sex pistols. Why not just do what you do? Yeah, let, let well, somebody else no. worry about editing it, you know? Getting attacked on the street for God Save the Queen, kind of, you know. <laughs> well, that's over there. Over here, we wouldn't care, right? Well, yeah, but they spent more time over there. The American tour over here broke them. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's a... What it's was it like here, reading about that stuff back then, too, as you're playing guitar and all this new stuff starts happening? What was that transition like from the 70s, like, you know, hard rock and all that into the punk era that they talk about? What, what was, was that? that like more your area stateside? Well, I mean, I mean yeah, I mean, because, uh, you know, being around, I grant at that time, you know, so late seventies and stuff will never really start hit. Cause even when we were talking about your cream magazine and stuff like that, you know, those, those places, uh, you know, you would, you would pick them up. Of course I'm buying them for kiss. That was, yeah. that was the main, main reason why I bought any of those, uh, you know, uh, magazines back then. They were was, one of the only artic- one of the only magazines back then that actually wrote about them somewhat favorably too. Uh, know? well, I, well, I'm trying to think if, uh, I mean, circus actually liked them. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, Cream was know. one of the first to pick up on them early on, though, in their career. Oh, well, that, that's, that's true. what it was. Yeah. Because Kiss oh, and yeah, Cream yeah, had a good relationship in the 70s, you can tell. Right. You know. Well, exactly. And, and, you know, that that meant that there was money, the whole, you know, uh, let, let's build this up together kind of deal. And we're not going to show photos without the makeup and, yeah. and stuff like that. Even though they kind of did in the early days before it became a thing, but they were all wearing sunglasses and nobody really cared at the time. So that issue just, you yeah. know, kind of went into obscurity. You know what yeah. I mean? I think well, they were well, at I the remember. airport in 74 getting ready to go on their first Canadian tour or something like well, that. Well, well they, they did the, uh, they did the uh, boy howdy. Yeah. Beer. Yeah, they and, that, and, and then then that's whenever they go ahead and they they show the pictures and I guess management for Kiss goes, what are you doing? And I think that uh, you know somebody who was taking the pictures go, hey, your management said we should get some photos of you without. And they're like, I never said that. So yeah. of course they were like you, you, and of course you know they kind of while they did get published there to whatever degree, again you you don't kill was, the uh, golden yeah. goose, you know. Yeah. So, 
it kind of came and went, like you said. It just it wasn't a big deal. Well, because you know, Kiss were still green back then. They weren't the biggest band in the world at the time that right. I remember. Yeah, they were still like what one or two years away from that. <laughs> yeah, but like you had like Kiss and the Stooges in Cream, right? Simultaneously, sure. for people who aren't aware, and you had the New York Dolls and David Bowie along with oh, yeah. Paul McCartney and the Stones. Like, you yeah. had a very wide range of all fringes of what was happening at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was just music, like we said again, yeah. in the 70s. It wasn't about rock music. It was just music, you know, Elton John. You know, yeah. I mean, great. everybody you mentioned were all still rock musicians, you yeah. know, but, but, but they the were... the vast you know, degree of the levels of rock and the different types of rock that they did. Oh, yeah. Actually... Yeah. Like, what's your, I, I guess what I'm getting at is what was your thoughts on punk watching it in real time? Did it give you a kick up the ass to kind of do something a little bit dirtier or was it something you didn't like? Um, kind of no, I, I, I like, I like sex pistols. Cause again, whenever these guys came out, I was probably about 14 or 15 and you know, so and you I'm didn't living differentiate or discriminate back then. You're just uh, no, no. Uh, well, we certainly saw saw and heard, you know, punk music. But the main thing was, you know, for me and still to this day is, you know, Sex Pistols. So whenever I think about punk, it, it, it was never my scene, but I liked I liked the uh, Nevermind the Bollocks. So I always thought that was great. And to this day, I still think it's a great record because it's catchy. It has melodies. Now, Grant, I would never as discorded it. as it is at the same time and cost it. Yeah. It's fucking brilliant. Oh yeah, well, well, again, you know, so uh, I don't know if even bands like The Clash, you know, those guys, of course, were starting to make their name at the time, but for some reason, you know, uh, also back then, we just didn't have the exposure. Yeah, you know, a, a lot you'd see photos of the bands and go, "Oh, these are rock." But unless you were able to buy the records, which some areas you couldn't even get these records. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, where, where I was, you know, that that was easy enough, but. By the same token, like I said, even if you get the record, it, you know, like the Kiss Alive stuff, <laughs> sit there and again, looking at the photos and, and life is good, you know, but if you talk about the punk stuff, I mean, you know, honestly, it, it, it didn't have any effect on me just because I go, I don't, you know, I don't dress like that. You know, I'm a, I'm a white kid from Western Maryland, small little town of Western Maryland, yeah. uh, out in the middle of nowhere. So there was no punk scene or anything in that area. You know, it was definitely much more. Where I'm went, from in York. Oh, is outside of York itself, even outside of the small town of Spring Grove. And I lived on a dead end street with the power station. We had a train track, like, you know, so we'd hear and feel the train going by. And, gotcha. Uh, we had cows <laughs> and shit like that out by uh, 45 minutes outside Lancaster and Gettysburg. Like, okay. You know. well, well, how far outside of York were you? Uh, about 25 minutes if you went down 83 and went into Springville, uh, Spring Grove, I mean, Springville's up here. Um, oh, okay. Well, because, uh, I mean, you know, funny money. We the played, town of Bear all Station. All of it was named after the train station. Okay. So, like, maybe 10 minutes from P.H. Gladfelder, the paper mill there in Spring Grove. I don't know if you know that area. Uh, I I don't. I mean, I, that's why I'm saying funny money. We played a, a bunch up through P, PA. was funny for me. Again, we go, we'd play, hey, we're in uh, Lancaster, something like yeah. that. Or, or, hey, we're over more Pittsburgh way or something like that. Uh, we're and, and I, we're I go, well, Lancaster than we were Pittsburgh by far. Oh, uh, okay. Because right. kind of yeah. well, well, Harrisburg, place like Harrisburg and such. Yeah. Okay. Gettysburg yeah, yeah. is closer than all of those. Okay. All right. So yeah, more like 30. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, right yeah. Right off of 30. You get the Spring Grove right off of 30. Okay. I, then I'm, I'm sure that I've seen signs because I drove 30. If you're time. going from like Harris, uh, from Gettysburg into York, right? You'll go down 30 straight for like, you know, a sure. half hour. Right. About 15 minutes there. There will be a turn off and there used to be a sheets there. I haven't been there in a long time, but you take that turn off. It'll take you through spring growth. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure I've probably seen signs for it at least. Yeah. You but know yeah, it by yeah, the I'll, smell, <laughs> the paper mill. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. We have one of those 
sent, you know, probably about 30 miles away from where I grew up at. But yeah, when you were around the paper mill, you knew you were around the paper mill. It was like that for me. So it was weird when I moved into town with my mom and everything was split between cliques and the skaters and the goths and the metalheads and these. And I kind of didn't fit anywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I was in between the goth metalhead skater. I was kind of end up, I, I didn't, you know, the only thing I wasn't too fond of that was popular at the time was emo. Oh, well, see, again, all that stuff escaped me. I would read about it in the magazines, but but even with that, it just, it really didn't, at least the punk stuff had kind of a visual. It's like, what's up with these guys and all the, you know, the, the piercings through their eyeballs and all that, all that kind of Which stuff. Which is weird because the Ramones just look like greasers with longer hair. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, again, see Ramones. I look at them and I go, you know, they're just a rock and roll band. In That's fact, the same they, way they I just... look at the New York Dolls. Well, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I would never call them punk. You know, I mean, I, I don't mean, think they were they definitely was... more raw and you know than a lot of others, but they could play. You yeah. Know? They were no different to me than a lot of the stuff that the Stones was doing in a, a lot of ways, you know. Why well, I'd say it's probably more of a street a, level. Well, I was gonna say, yeah, probably a little bit more. Yeah, you know, it's just tough being uh uh I I, I maybe it's like with uh, Bruce Springsteen now. It it's hard to, to be blue collar man whenever you know that the guy's worth five hundred million dollars. They I mean, say it, the same it, thing it's about tough. John Lennon, for God's sakes, man. Yeah. Like, heaven forbid. But, but that's it. 1964 John Lennon isn't the same as the, you know, the 1980 or the 1970 John Lennon. Not, He's not by always change. changing as a sure, human sure. Good. Yeah, and, and it doesn't have to be bad or, or worse. But, but yeah, again, yeah, it's just getting older. And, and certainly the Beatles, you know, there was four guys who really, really knew what it was like to be in the Beatles. Just like there's four guys who knew what it was like to be in Kiss or Led Zeppelin and yeah. all that kind of stuff, you know? So if you're not within that, you can have all the perspective you want from the outside, but you and I, as Kiss fans, I, I so whenever I was living in LA and this was, uh, this was in 90, 92, I think, uh, I worked at a 7-Eleven in West Hollywood uh corner corner west hollywood and uh beverly hills that sounds so, fun yeah it, it, it you know i mean suck that you have to work while you're out there or you're trying to make make something musically wise but, yeah. but not it, it was a great place actually to work because all the people oh, okay. that i would meet yeah 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 so it actually it was it was actually cool quite quite that uh, great some of the it. stories i've heard about la for musicians they're quite seedy and <laughs> yeah. uh, well again that that's why everybody you know think baltimore you know same same deal well except la has lot, lots of stars but we, we nice have... in new york city i'll give it that yeah new york city uh, war zone <laughs> Uh, but, well, again, well, this is back then, so it, it's yeah. always tough. But yeah, things are just a little wackadoodle right now and stuff. So it's hopefully that all seven out. But but with the with working there at Seven yeah, Eleven, I was uh, basically one two streets off of Hollywood Boulevard. I was right beside Santa Monica Boulevard, and then awesome. I have to from Hollywood. So you know, if you ever see the Tower Records, uh, if you ever happen to see that in movies. Whenever they're cruising down Sunset Boulevard and they see Tire Records, uh, that that was the one that was right there. So, uh, but anyway, right, oh, right, right at actually, center of the right, universe at the time, basically. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, very. Oh, that's why I was out there. So <laughs> I just didn't know that I was in the universe. But the um, so so we like my regular customers because they lived right in the condos right across from that Tower Records, which nobody knew, of course, mind you. But nonetheless, David Lee Roth and Axel both live there so they were they were my regular customers we were the closest convenience store to them so we would they would come in and you know buy whatever they bought and you have a little small chat and stuff and hey would you sign this sure blah 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 and, you nice. know all, that's all, really all that cool kind of stuff. so yeah and that that was right whenever the uh, illusions were getting ready to go ahead and come out because i'd actually asked axel in the back of circus magazine they would always say i forget what the, the name of the column was like rumors or whatever it was but basically they would thinly thinly disguise you know a, a popular rumor hey some some big band is having trouble with uh, their drummer and they don't think he's going to last very long so they might have to get out their uh uh 
uh, I, I don't know, uh, r- rifles and rifles and lilacs to go ahead. And <laughs> oh, okay. You know, so, gotcha. Yeah, something. Good. Yeah, so they would just they, rather than say it right out, right? So it's all rumor stuff. But I think uh, that's kind of cool. Well, as, I, again, as a writer, cool. that would be fun to come well, up with. Fun. Well, compared like to that. now, though, I mean, think about yeah. now. You know. You know, you and I can have this done and the rest of the world can see it in 30 minutes after we're done and and it's never going to go away, you know, but um, but but it was interesting. So, yeah, let's say Axel would come in and and we were talking and one of the one of the rumors in the back of the magazine was that supposedly Axel had this nine minute song and wasn't willing to go ahead and cut anything out of it, blah, 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 is really being a pain in the butt. And I, I just I asked him in you know some shape or form about it. And he goes, uh. No, that that's not true at all. You know, blah blah blah. And so you know, you just start to realize where where rumors start, and and if you can actually talk to the person, you kind of go. Now, Grant, he might have been lying to me at the same time, but I think it was coma. I think that was the actual song. Okay. So which actually ended up, which ended up a pretty long song anyway, though. So yeah, I I'll be honest. I love those records probably more than I love Appetite these days. What? I love Appetite. But I got to say, the creativity and songs like Breakdown and all the different stuff that they were doing proved that they were just more than another Hollywood band at the time. I think it was the perfect record at the time for them. Yeah, but do you think Appetite actually sounds like any other Hollywood band that was out at the time? No. I think that's why, that's no, why it does had an impact because it didn't freaking sound like you know, the, the same stuff that everybody else was putting out. And Trust me, they, I agree. I think it's the fact that they expanded their lyrical vocabulary quite a bit from record one to the double album. Yeah. You know. I, I wish they would have took the illusions and made one really good record. I'm I'm not a fan. There of is some filler on those. For stuff, sure. but, uh, yeah. And you just kind of go, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, for me, in fact, I remember the night that they went on sale at Tower Records. So it would be whatever. June 1st. I find it interesting sale. that the uh, Illusion 2 has still outsold Illusion 1. And I love Illusion 2 a lot. I think I'd have to give that one the upper hand, my personal self. Well, what's one? Uh, you said you like two more than one or one more than two? I like two more than one. And, and what's one? What's the hits off of two? I mean, yeah, uh, don't Civil cry. War, 14 Years, Estranged. Uh, uh, the alternate don't cry is okay. Uh, so fine. You could be mine, you know, pretty tied up. Um, you know, some really good stuff breakdowns on that as well. Did, I, did you know that, uh, you could be mine was actually recorded for the first record? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 every time I heard that back. Yeah. yeah Cause, cause that's it, why it, it was up. on the appetite sleeve. It was yeah. in the appetite sleeve. But but you know it's nobody like, heard it until you saw the uh, 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 Terminator. Yeah, it, it was on it that. And I'm that. like, that's why it was a great song. I can't wait for their next record. And you know, there's one of those where it was written for the first record and and didn't make it. Yeah, there's know? a lot of those songs on those records that are like that. I like that. I think I like that Izzy and Duff got a little bit of vocal room to go along with Axel too on that record. You yeah. had a lot of different cool stuff going i don't know i like the feel of it too sometimes it's not just the songs it's the vibe a record gives yeah well you got you got two records so you got you know probably roughly almost two hours to go ahead and get your vibe across yeah right question is do you have two hours worth of saying something but both records are so vastly different in vibe i think yeah you know uh right next door to hell kicks off user illusion one and that's balls out punk venom blistering you know everything i love about raw rock and roll really and then you got dust and bones after that which is really bluesy and dark yeah you know i don't know but i just i think it's wild that you were right around that time and that's the year i was born <laughs> and and what, you're, what 79 or, or oh you're talking 91, about 92. when you 91. were in Seven Eleven with action yeah, coming yeah. in and oh yeah man, man. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Paul Stanley came in there. And uh, yeah, so he came in. I, I know it's a goofy story. I've told it to my friends who who aren't bored with it yet. But, uh, you know, it, it was cool. Whenever I'd be working, um, a, a lot of times, if it was somebody who I really, really wanted to talk to, 
all of a sudden like traffic, you know, business would just kind of die off. So Paul, Paul Stanley comes in one night and he goes, Hey, uh, do you have any, uh, toothbrushes? I'm like, yeah, well, we probably have it like in the second aisle down there on the top. So he goes looking back there. I always kept a spiral notebook underneath the counter for autographs. Oh, so nice. I, so I, I could always, you know, just always be ready and stuff. So, anyway, so, and he goes, oh, I, don't, I don't see it. And I said, oh, well, you should be back up there or whatever like that. So anyway, he goes, well, I guess you're out. So, and I, I don't know why, but I said, hey, uh, you know, we're probably getting another shipment in like in two days. So we'll probably have some there. It's like Paul's. Paul's going to wait two days to come back to the 7-Eleven, see if we got any new toothbrushes in. So it was stupid. But anyway, so he goes, oh, okay, well, thanks anyway. And I said, hey, would you mind signing this for me? He goes, sure. And again, like I said, nobody came in. Everything's like, uh, uh yeah. everything stopped. So he, he signed that. So I started talking to him and stuff. And uh, uh, and, he, and he was cool. And, you know, it's usually, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan boy. Uh, but by the same token, you know, I mean, if it's kiss, I kind of know what I'm talking about a lot of the times. So, so it I'm saying, Hey, you to treat them like a human being, doesn't it? Well, 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 it's just so, so you can relate, right? Yeah. You know, rather than so, cause put it this way, somebody comes up to Paul McCartney, he goes, Paul, you're great. Thank you. How many times has he heard that? And what's he supposed to say after, you know, Yeah. I know. You know, uh, that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's just, he wants something different. In fact, I heard Paul now, uh, Paul won't take any, any pictures. He won't sign anything. He won't take any pictures because he wants a one-on-one -on -one with the person. He goes, I just want this relationship. Cause he goes half the time, the photos don't turn out and blah, blah, blah. And somebody's going to turn around and sign my signature. So I don't do that stuff anymore. He goes, I'll just, I'll just have a quick little chat with them and make a one-on-one -on -one thing. I'm like, that's great. But given the choice. I want to either an autograph or a photo with Paul McCartney. I don't want to chat with him. Yeah, like I get signatures a lot and I don't sell them. I've got one on display. You know, I would just be like, dude, I bought this cassette of your latest record and I really love it. It's my favorite of your McCartney one, two, three inputs. Will you please sign this cassette tape for me? I'm not going to sell it. It's going. I out. always have it signed to me. Oh, yeah. say, could, could you exactly because then they know okay yeah. you know yeah oh yeah yeah no, I, I, but that, that's that's the way i am and and so so paul sat there and you know so he would you know kind of slowly work his way over to the front door while we were still chatting but i was asking hey you guys are obviously doing your record what's it sound like uh, all that kind of stuff and i remember he goes uh well i think it kind of sounds like destroyer so for him to say you know destroyer in his world is like baloney or or uh whatever milk but for me whenever he said it sounds like destroyer it's like sounds like destroyer because i grew up and it's a part of my life yeah for him, for him again that's like paul mccartney you're great the beatles are great thank you what you know it, it he was a beatle so he doesn't see it the same way and unfortunately we'll never you know all these people who we admire and and all that kind of stuff they'll they'll never get the same vibe or, or the same enjoyment out of themselves that that we got from them you know like we'll never go freaking yeah. kiss alive three that changed my life that kind of stuff they'll go yeah that was a good record you know and, and even whenever you write your own song it's the same thing you know i get people come up and and ask for certain solo songs and and i go uh, they go man you playing that tonight i'm like it's in there and uh but i i'll never get the you know the quote the joy yeah, uh, it, it, that they do. I wrote a song. I think it's good, but I don't go home and put it on and listen to it whenever I need a yeah. lift or something like that. You know what I mean? So I don't do so that as, either as with my own stuff. Well, well, right, right. And I'm sure Paul McCartney and nobody does it, you know. Yeah, but I'm absolutely mean. certain of but, that. But, but, and yet we, you and I would both more than uh, happy to go up to somebody else who we admire and go, man, thanks for the great music. You yeah. know, you, you, you've actually made an impact on our world and everything like that and that what you know what else can they do it goes thanks because again paul mccartney will never know what what the what the beatles meant to the world he'll never know he just won't well in kiss's defense i think yeah. the kiss conventions open their eyes a bit well i, well, I think it makes the them appreciate it makes them appreciatively but again paul paul's not going to go ahead and get out do tour oh, rock no, no, not go, at all. man listen to me on that yeah. Man, that inspires me to want to go ahead and be in a band. You know, that's that's I'm, what I'm I mean. Gonna I'm gonna make a joke and I'm gonna say it because it's on my mind. I know you're probably thinking it too. That sounds more like what Gene would do. And the, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Yeah. Well, well, you know, of course, of course, we could turn this into a huge, uh, you know, Gene, Gene and Paul comparison thing. But yeah, I just think the funny thing is Gene, you know, Gene and Paul both very much, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to assume that the kiss pie is 50 50. The only yeah. difference is that Gene will talk about his part of the pie and <laughs> Paul, Paul won't. He'll just go, thank you and keep keep moving on, you know. It's, and, it's just funny how and, and people don't understand how dysfunctional and crazy and hard it is being in a band. Yeah, yeah it, it is a truly relationship. Yeah, man. And particularly for that long and all that, you oh, know, because yeah. they, you know, those guys, you know, they go, ah, you know, we love each other. Doesn't mean we see eye to eye on everything. So yeah, it is what it is. My, my brother and I are certainly in the same way. And certainly my wife and I are the same and way. Yeah. Over the years, we can see now, especially with the Internet, that a lot of the stuff that would be put in the press about them bad mouthing each other is all for promotional purposes. Cause it's not reality. Yeah. You know? well, well, exactly. Well, you know, you watch reality shows and there's nothing real. <laughs> we knew that. There is nothing real about a reality show. It's an everything ironic. staged. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's about, yeah. You know, it's about drama one way or another. It's just about drama and, you know, keeping people engaged, interested and, you know, oh, it's yeah. just not, not my cup of tea for reality stuff. I want to watch a good horror movie. Oh yeah. At yeah. least you know what you're getting with that. Well, I, I hope. You know how hard it is to find a good uh, horror movie anymore, though? It's freaking oh, tough. man. I, you know? I, I go back to the classics time and time again. I love Christopher <laughs> Lee. Rest in peace. He's my favorite actor ever. And oh, there you go. He made some records before he died. Those are awesome. I, love I, I, I think I've heard like maybe one one cut or something like that but uh yeah so I, I don't i can't say i have christopher in my in my record collection but but yes as, as an actor and certainly the vampire and all that kind well, of stuff for that. for him to put out a two like two or three heavy metal records when he's like 80 and 90 years old there god you go. bless you sir he's there like i always wanted to make heavy metal music you know so yeah but yeah hey, which, even that, even, that, even that statement by itself doesn't really what do you mean you've always wanted to make heavy metal? That does, doesn't sound right. Yeah. Well, because well, you kind of go, hey, if you want to make heavy metal music, you're not going to tell everybody you're making heavy metal music. You're just going to make the music and let somebody go, that's pretty heavy metal. You well, know yeah. what I mean? And that's kind of what we're talking about I, again. You know? I, I, th I think because he had no musical training in that way that he had to have um, Richie Faulkner actually help him like arrange it and oh. stuff like that. Um, oh, I got gotcha. you. You, you know, because he had stuff written out and stuff, but obviously Christopher Lee, he had it more classically arranged. So, right. And it's also cool because he was related to Charlemagne, so he did it all based on Charlemagne. Yeah. See, well, maybe maybe I need to check out my uh, uh, <laughs> Christopher Lee uh, heavy metal stuff. It, and uh... it's interesting and it's fun. You know, yeah. that's all I could say. It, it's well done for what it is. It reminds me of some Nostradamus -y stuff that Priest did on that. Oh, Priest, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the last tour I saw him on. And, uh, you know, they were, they were still pretty good there. And, um, you know, yeah, it's yeah, just a big, uh, yeah, I'm definitely a big Priest fan as well. Oh, yeah, my dad's a lot, that, a lot of the 70s and even the 80s stuff. I loved all the. Uh, I love rock and roll. I yeah. don't care. Uh, I'll die see, on that again, hill. You, you, you go to the older ones. Uh, but I, I go to more probably around British Steel and uh, uh, even well, uh, Point of Entry, you know, Scream for Vengeance. Uh, but but again, still still a lot. Sin after Sin. That's yeah, a great. Record. That's a great record. That's a great record. Stuff. So, yeah, we used to do uh, Last Rose of Summer. Oh, nice, I know. nice. I know. That's great, a great, cut. great, great tune. I think I've seen them do it live, like not anytime recently, but. But, you yeah. know, an older clip and stuff like that. When they were opening for Foreigner in 77. Oh, they, they were? See, I didn't realize that's who they were. On their with. first major U.S. tour when they did wow. Sin After Sin for Columbia and they toured America, they were opening for Foreigner, I think. That, that's, a, that's a good match. <laughs> 77, Sin After Sin. Sin a rider. Sin -a. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's God crazy. damn. So that's kind of cool that all of these influences are so vastly different. So where does your musical career start with um, 
in oh, well, well, that that was that was the ninth grade. So whenever I was a freshman, then me and three other guys who I'd never met before, all uh, we end up getting together because me and another guitarist were uh, both of our older brothers were already in a band together. That's probably how we met. I think. Oh, okay. I think I think the other guy is named Tim Tim Haynes, uh, who I still do acoustic stuff with nice. stuff with to this day. Uh, but I think he used to come over. Uh, bands always re used to rehearse it at uh, our house. So then after that, then I think uh the other guys you know younger brother would come over and get guitar lessons from the guitar player in that band yeah uh anyway so eventually we got together and originally like i said i wanted to be a drummer and whenever i get my very first band i'm just the singer and uh of course so so tim and i were both huge kiss fans the bass player was a he brought in unleashed from the east oh that nice was, yeah so i remember him bringing in so yeah so we learned you know uh well, back then we learned uh, Green Man Leashy and, uh, you know, before I, the dawn. I was going to say, which one did you try to learn from that? Because vocally, that would be a hell of a task. Yeah, well, well that and uh, Diamonds and Rust. Oh, yeah. Oh. You know. When I saw them, I've seen them twice. I saw them in 2004 and 2018. Mm -hmm. Yep. I saw him in for Firepower. I covered it. That was a great show. I was more there for Deep Purple, if I'm honest, at that time, because I seen him in 2005. Oh, um, gotcha. At the Giant Center in 2005, I saw him. And that was amazing. But when they did Diamonds and Rust, it was the acoustic version. While the acoustic uh -huh. version is beautiful in its own right, I wish I would have gotten to hear at least once the, you know what yeah, I mean? Man. Yeah, man, that, all, all that stuff's great. Well, let's see, first time we saw um, Priest, uh, we, most of the places that there, uh, most times we saw concerts back in the in the eighties was at the Cap Center down in Largo. Okay. So, so yeah, so I mean, that's kind of where, a legendary venue when you look back at bootlegs. I've got a couple Kiss shows from there. Yeah. And, you know. Well, well, if you see Kiss Dynasty from there, that was yeah, the first I have it on DVD. Yeah, I have that's it on a, DVD. They, there you go. Right. So, so we went and we saw him on that and that was 79. So that was my first full up, uh, stuff, uh, then. I was and amazed then, uh, by Peter's backing vocals on that show. Uh, well, I can't say I paid attention to it, but I always thought Peter sounded great live. Well, the only, I, only time he ever sounded sketchy was maybe on Beth whenever he had to really kind of sing and he's all by his lonesome. You I've know, heard so. some of the farewell tour recordings and some of those are pretty sketchy. Oh, I, I see. You'll have to send me some of them then. If you find any that you go, yeah, Peter's not really good on this one. But but again, it's hard to tell. You know what? what the the tempos story. were really slow. But when I got, they did the off the soundboard. Right. I got the first one. I saw them in two thousand four, and I have the instant live from Hershey. I don't need another, you know, thing from that tour. No, but gotcha. I got the first one because it was such a rare occurrence to have Ace and Eric Singer together night and day difference yeah why well, oh yeah eric eric's just great well i yeah. think in all fairness over the years peter obviously getting older as a drummer it's going to be harder it, and well, again you know but but if that's legitimately it or whether it's you know and I, i'm not saying that's i'm not, I'm not certain i'm just saying there's some songs where I mean, I can pull out certain songs that Peter didn't play on originally that are sluggish, but it was just in general, uh, especially watching the Kissology Volume 3, mm -hmm. you know, some of the footage on that, you know, from the Farewell Tour, I can see why they were going to call it a day in some areas, you know. What, because you mean uh, it was slow, you mean? The tempos were just so slow. Yeah. They well, felt course, kind of lethargic in a way. Well, a lot of that stuff, though, also, if you look at a lot of the 80s stuff, they freaking burned through that stuff. Yeah, that is true. It, but this it was, was the like opposite. The, like, yeah. Yeah. But, but if it's obviously that slow, then yeah. You know, I only then. ever know, I didn't notice it when I was there when I was 10. And maybe that's part of the problem is when you go back and re-listen. <laughs> Wait, well, you were 10, so yes. But when you go back and re-listen, you could hear some of that stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that the 2001 show isn't without quirks. I mean, Ace's solo where he does the Space Oddity 2001 thing is a little bit sloppy and eh, but 
you know, whatever it's rock and roll. I'm not worried about that. But I mean, it was, I just remember listening to the millennium concert from kiss in 2000 on my right. iPod. And it was just, I had to turn it off because everything was just so, it felt lethargic. It felt tired. You yeah. know what I mean? And well, it's, it, that could be that it, whenever you start to actually hear it and you go, eh, yeah, if they, if they sound you know tired, that's never, if it comes across audibly that, that you're, you're to tired. To me, because I'm a musician, yeah. I notice, you know, you and I listen to music differently than the general public. So to sure. speak, in a way, you yeah. know, so, I mean, we can hear those little nuances you know, and I'll agree with you in the eighties, they burn through things so quick. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. So I, I'm not as big as fan as uh, the eighties, you know, just to e even their musical output. You know, I do like a lot of the records. I don't feel they changed all incredibly that much, but I know what you're getting at. There's a lot of songs that are filler crap. It seems yeah. more towards the later eighties. It gets harder to listen to. But then you got yeah. revenge, and that was a return to form. So, I and I agree that that yeah, that's the. Sorry, that's my cat again. That's <laughs> there you go. I mean, so, uh, but uh, growing but, up, but, but yeah, growing up with all this stuff, you started in high school as a singer. Yeah. What was the band and, called? Where did you play at? <laughs> uh, again, again, uh, Western Maryland, Cumberland, Maryland. Uh, we were uh, first band was called Aries. Was the very first band that was as a, a freshman we did that and the only reason why i ever picked up that thing was because we actually oddly enough we were doing oh sorry what <laughs> yeah nice. so, so we we were doing uh yeah it's funny so that that's how long i've i i quote uh <laughs> knew, knew that for all these years but um Oh, 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 which, by the way, the, the drummer for that original band, uh, Jeff Sears, he brought in uh, Rush. And I'm like, what's up with this guy's voice? Yeah. And so, you know, this is probably around, you know, 20 and 12 is getting close to permanent waves somewhere around okay. there. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and, you know, and I, I certainly fell in love with Rush, uh, permanent, permanent waves. I think I fell in love with Rush because of Getty's voice. Oh, I there don't you know go. why. It, it, it could be very, uh, you know, polarizing right yeah very you could, polarizing you could go, I what is he had that a yeah. voice a good voice he had good range and you yeah. know my first rush was all the world's a stage my mom gave me that cassette <laughs> there you go oh yeah well, and and that was probably uh that was know, a live that, record from the 2112 tour released i think the same year or shortly after so right so so and that that was one because i remember him coming in and you want to <laughs> Right. So he was, he was wanting to come in and bring all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but that, that was actually the first band. And again, the only reason why I, I even picked up a guitar was because we had some harmony guitars in Detroit. So he was one of them, or if we yeah. just needed the rhythm guitar for some stuff while Tim went and played the sound a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That was the only reason why I ever picked up guitar. So he showed me a couple of the basic chords and you know, I've never taken any lessons. Me so, neither. I'm the same way. I was shown yeah. three chords in the power chord, and yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, songs, and, there, and there you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, well, well and again, it, it's yeah, it's just funny. I mean, even you know, because I've done a ton of teaching over over the time uh, as well, and so the cool thing about Cobain is, of course, obviously, he got a lot of people playing guitar. You know, just wanting it's, to rock out. It's really weird. Have you played any of his stuff or had to teach sure. any? Yeah. Wouldn't you say his courting was really simple, but yet weird and unique for some songs? Like some of the deeper cuts are kind of quirky. What, 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 what they are, because, yeah, instead of uh, playing the proper chord, maybe just throw a bar across that would add in a note that you normally wouldn't hear all the time. And he yeah. goes, yeah, but it works. And again, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. He had a good sense of melody. I'll give him that. Oh, no. Well, and again, he was a huge Beatle fan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there's, and again, you know, I don't know. I listened oh, to John Lennon's Plastic Ono record. Uh, I, I, I don't think I can deal with anything that, that uh, Yoko really uh, makes her presence felt. I just, no, the, the, the John Lennon Plastic Ono band record. Right. 
It has no Yoko because Yoko did her own version. Oh, okay. Didn't this know has that. working class hero and mother on it. Okay, I got you. I got you. I listened to some of that, like songs like Well, 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 the scream thing. I'm like, this is literally, I can hear where Kurt Cobain got a lot of stuff from John Lennon alone. On that oh, there record. you go. Because it's so visceral and stuff. Right. I thought that was unique, but I only looked at that in hindsight, like recently when I yeah. revisited, when they remastered them and I listened to it just to hear the differences in the different mixes. And I listened to Well, Well, Well. I'm like, he's playing the, you know, Well, Well, Well. Like he's playing the guitar notes and singing it mm -hmm. you know, at the same time, a very bluesy thing. But I'm like, and then he's like, screaming till his voice like cracks i'm like jesus christ how did i not put this two together before yeah you know because it's been documented he was such a big john lennon fan but it's funny how oh, yeah. in hindsight when you look back in history you can see where certain things may have came from that you know nobody really necessarily thinks of it's weird why why put it this way it's almost like looking at a part of the sky and you only see this much now, whenever you step back, like, oh, wait, now I see the Big Dipper. Mm -hmm. you know? So it, it is true. Whenever you're in the moment, you're you're isolated and you're focused on, yeah. on just that. And then you look back. But, you know, but the same thing with, the uh, again, Kurt, uh, he, I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but otherwise, he wasn't a very good guitar player. He was perfect for what Nirvana needed. So, exactly. again, that, that's two separate things. That doesn't mean that he couldn't play guitar, but exactly what he needed for nirvana but if anybody aspires to quote man i hope one day i'm as good as kurt i'm like that well that, all right all right i thought the same thing yeah. about sid vicious before i knew exactly how he was and then when i learned that he didn't even play on the record and i at 14 could play the record that he couldn't play on and i saw right. the winterland concert and i realized i'm like oh my god yeah nope <laughs> Oh, I got to, uh, well, of course, it was it, the, um, is it Paul Cook? Is that the bass player? The drummer. Uh, who, who, who am I thinking of the bass player? Why well, can I not think of? Glenn Matlock. Yeah, Glenn Matlock. Yeah, so he put out a book, you know, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. past couple of years and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, I want to I wanna get, you know, I want to get Sex Pistols guys, you know, autographs while I can get them. So I just looked for their books and, and he had it for sale. You could buy it straight from him. It was like whatever, twenty five bucks, and ship it from the UK. And I said, "Hey, would you mind Are putting still on?" Available? <laughs> uh, well, I, I I don't know. Mine's actually probably sitting. I don't know how much you can see, but these are all my these are all my books right here. Because that's so, one yeah. I didn't hear about. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to find it and see. Uh, but yeah, so I end up doing it, uh, getting him to write in there, and you know, I mean, I did a couple, you know, emails back and forth to you know make sure. I was going to get it and all that stuff. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll write, you know, if you want something in there, put it in there. So I, I put in there something like, you know, uh, the the original or the real bass player for the Sex Pistols or something like that. And then I said, uh, God save the queen, you know, put that in there too, because he wrote that. Yeah. So uh, so and anyway, you know, and that's what he did. So he, he did just as a question. So now again, that's like a little fanboy. It's like the personalization. Yeah. Here's what I want. Even whenever I met Getty Lee, uh, my best friend and I went up to uh, outside of Pittsburgh to go see Getty Lee on, on that book tour they did, uh, like what, probably a year and a half ago now. And uh, anyway, so of course, you know, you could put a note in there, what do you want Getty to write and yes. stuff. So whenever it came up your turn, he took it up and obviously looked at the note and stuff. So I just wanted him to write, uh, this is the spirit of radio, because I always think about a live record. Yeah, I this love that spirit. record. I love yeah. that song. I mean, it's cool, but you know, but there, there's so much stuff. But it's even stranger yeah. because you know, uh, you know, obviously that's a Neil lyric, and yet you know, I sit there and I think of Geddy Lee and I think of Rush, you know, Spirit of Radio. That, that's a song, but you think of lyric wise, well, yeah. that was Neil. That wasn't even him. You know, it's not even him. His idea, I guess, per se. But but obviously, Geddy is the one who I'm sure said, "This is the Spirit of Radio." Well, here's the thing that I, because um, my buddy who's a singer in a band called Lord Vicar out of Finland, and they're a doom band. Um, I compliment him all the time on how beautiful the songs are and how beautiful the words are. He said, well, that's the guitarist that 
department, I just say, I'm, I'm like, you convey the emotion. Sure. Oh, no, no. That's I, equally I as important as the person who writes it. Yeah. Well, I mean, Elton John, Bernie Taupin. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, all that, all those great lyrics and Elvis del or Elton delivers it and you go, what a great line. But, yeah, you yeah. know, if Bernie sang it, would we go, cool line, but, you know, it might be missing that little. That little push. That, yeah. Yeah. I think it just makes it over top of that. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, like I said, whenever we got in the band, uh, but I digress, as they say. So we we went and we, you know, we kind of carried on for probably, I don't know, about a year with that original band and then other bands and stuff through uh, high school and eventually get out and you start playing. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a pretty successful band up in Cumberland called Idiots Rule okay. um, in, in that time period as well, you know, just from the Jane's Addiction, it was named before I ever got out there uh but nonetheless so then eventually i ended up going out to la for you know roughly 88 to 92 kind of deal and then um i came back and was living back in town and and it's like well i'm gonna go ahead and you know write write some of my own stuff and it was simply came from uh, i didn't want to have to you know if i had a singer in a band you know he would tend to write stuff and i, and I always wrote the music very very kind of van halen idea I'll yeah. write the music and then you come up with the the, the lyrics I and the melody. I just want to be a guitar player, man. <laughs> well, well, again, you know, it just did. I just didn't really care or care enough to say, hey, you let me. You have anything to say. Yeah, well, exactly. That that would be the other aspect. I probably really didn't really care in general wise. So, and again, I was just coming up with the, the music wise. So, uh, but, you know, every now and again, you get a, a singer who you just don't really, it's like, eh, I don't like that lyric. Uh, you know, yeah. I wish you wouldn't sing it, but you kind of don't rock the boat. You go, eh, whatever, it's not a big deal. So anyway, so then I finally decided I'm going to go ahead and, and write some stuff. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write the, you know, write everything, uh, as it were. And then that way I don't have to answer to anybody else. So if it's a dumb yeah. lyric, then I can only blame myself for it or something yeah. like that. You know, and, and you say, and I, yeah, it's a dumb lyric. So what? <laughs> well, 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 yeah. And again, it's different between uh, my lyrics. OK, they're fine or or hey i think that's a really good lyric you know I, I you know i don't look back at any of them and go that's just a dumb lyric because again somebody else that might be the one song that somebody else really likes because of the lyrics you know but yeah that that doesn't make me doesn't make you necessarily stick your chest out for all of them you think some are better than others you know yeah so that that's actually so i went and i recorded those songs put them on cassette because that's what was available at the time yep. and hand them out to friends and they would say hey what's uh uh these are cool what's the name of the band i said it's not a band it's me by myself solo so whenever i decided to go ahead and go out and play i needed a name and stuff i go well instead of s-o-l-o -L -L, i said i'll just break it up in two things so i said it's solo there you, you go <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's that's exactly where the name came from that's all there is to it it's funny because it, you know it almost sounds like it should be a grunge so low but it's not it's solo kind you know, of as, yeah, as in like it, it one has, word it has know? that edge to it now that you mention it i'm thinking about it it kind of yeah. has that aesthetic to it but i guess well, I mean, it could, it could it, i it, like the play on words once again like we mentioned before yeah you know yeah and, and that but that again yeah that was the whole idea i just wanted to answer to anybody else and i did it so it's me it's me solo by myself kind of stuff so uh but but that's where all that stuff ended up uh you know going with that and you know that that didn't really it was just more about recording and stuff and getting it out and that was a long time ago but yeah. you know and the next thing I know then uh at least while I'm out you know doing some of those shows for the band then I said well you know I want to be as good as I can be and up to that point for the most part I was you know backup singer always singing like usually high harmonies and stuff um which I quite frankly I enjoy probably more than singing lead for the most part but okay. um uh, anyway, so then uh, I saw Steve, you know, Kicks had just broken up and this was in, I think, about 92. Okay. So in, in Maryland, musician, PA musician up your way, that kind of stuff. They would, uh, you know, you have ads up here and one of them said, hey, you know, uh, Kicks singer, you know, give him vocal lessons, blah, 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 you know, call. And, and my mind said, it's like, hey, um, you know, he's never he's never sucked any times I've seen him. I was I was always a big Kicks fan. And, and he, 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 they were stellar every time I saw him and stuff like that. So I go, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, check out getting a couple of vocal lessons from him. So he happened to be, he's born and raised up in Piedmont, West Virginia, which is about 
20 couple minutes uh, outside of where I was born and raised. So he was kind of, you know, local boy, as it were, whatever like that, yeah. even though kick were, kicks were based more out of the Hagerstownish kind of area, you know, yep. even though it's called a Baltimore band, but, you know, they're much more Hagerstown. Yeah. It's Baltimore and, just sounds better on paper. Well, yeah, it's a lot more like this. So, um, well, it's funny. Actually, I remember uh, reading Krang magazine, you know, from the UK. Yeah. And, and they were doing a story on kicks, uh, or kicks was part of one of the stories, should I say, at least. And they said, yeah, this band hails from uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. And they said, uh, we have no idea where that is, but they're based out of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So I guess, again, a little bit more familiar to the average reader and stuff. Certainly over in the UK, nobody knows where Hagerstown is. So, yeah, so, yeah but, but I went and well, I got lessons like that. And it's and funny you mentioned the Krang, because I was friends with, um, before he passed away, a guy named Kel Hellraiser who used to write for Metal Hammer and Kerrang, I think, over there back in the day. And he okay. was actually Poison's first manager in the UK. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I think Malcolm Dome is, I think, uh, does that name sound familiar to you? From, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, that, that's, that's the only name that sticks in my brain from the Kerrang stuff. Yeah, Kel Hellraiser did a lot more of the glam stuff back then in the UK and pretty much made a lot of those bands career over there because not a lot of people would have gave a shit about a lot of the bands at that time like that. Yeah. He was also close with Tiger Tales back then, too. I got you. Um, and Tiger Tales, were, they, those guys were like all the blonde guys? Yeah, they've kind of had that recognition, but I am friends with the original vocalist, um, Stevie James. And yeah, that whole thing's kind of a mess. <laughs> they have the rat syndrome right now, if you know what I mean. Oh, I got you. Yeah, they yeah. Have a song how many... in a movie that, you know, is going to bring certain people money. <laughs> I got it. Is, are they still actually a band band or there's not? a tiger tails USA with the one drummer. Oh, oh, just the drummer. Man, I can't wait to go see the there's bass a tiger player. tails USA. And I think there's a active tiger tails, but the original singer and them are like complete fucking enemies to some degree. Uh, and I'm not degrading anybody. This is pretty much public knowledge. Sure. Um, but yeah, Ace Fincham, the original drummer, has Tiger Tails USA, and uh, he's got a look-alike lineup. Stevie James was actually joking about it. He's like, they've got a singer that looks like me with the blonde hair and everything. What the hell? Like I said, it's the rat syndrome thing going. Um, yeah, the, it is funny, though, looking back at whenever I think about bands like that, that I you know was reading about... Uh, you know back in the day and stuff but never necessarily got into them or they didn't get a whole you know, they get real big like tiger japan tang that those guys oh, they were great too a lot know? of those bands but but again did they, those bands you know always kind of stayed at that c level they yeah. weren't uh, you know they weren't like right there like like kicks was a b-level band they're yeah. right on the cusp all the time but were never able to get up to the poison that's a shame level. even with blow my fuse my god yeah man yeah, yeah. Again, lots of behind the scenes stuff with, uh, you know, all that that you know, I, I come to find, you know, throughout throughout the years of late night, late night drives and stuff with Steve and Jimmy and, and stuff. But but in general wise, you know, it's just just one of those things that a lot of it still boiled down to record company just kind of didn't didn't quite know what to do with them a lot of the times and stuff and and that. And then there's, of course, then. Uh, without naming names, but there's somebody in the band who was very, very well known for kind of creating some riffs with the, you know, the the record company and button heads with the record company and the record company is like, let us do our job. And he was more like, no, I want to do this. Let us do our job. No, I want to do this. And so you kind of, it's almost like you do all the great stuff. I've dealt with people like that in the past before where they would go out and, and plaster all the flyers, you know, at the mall, wherever to go ahead and get everybody to come out to the show. And then halfway through the show, they would get blitzed out of their mind and, you know, and then it goes Be unable <clears throat> to do anything. Right. Exactly. So it's like, hey, there. You did all the great stuff, or, you know, it could also be like the, the GNR stuff where, Hey, you guys are doing great. And the next thing you know, then Axel has a meltdown and just pisses everybody off instead of like, you know, how hard bands work to get to this level. And you yeah. got it freaking pissing it away, you know? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. We figure disease, that. man. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is one of That's those. probably another reason why I don't have a full time band. I dealt with lead singer disease when we were when I was in my first band and we were just a crappy, you know, whatever band we were young, figuring out how we worked together, how we could gel. You mm -hmm. know, it was rough. Uh, but somehow we we did a summer of shows and writing and stuff, and we were going to take some time and regroup the next summer and write some new stuff. And, you know, because our bass player was in college and shit like that, you mm -hmm. know, and next summer, Oh, singer doesn't show up to rehearsal. We're playing without him. And, you know, it just ended just because he got, some kind of ego and you know i'm the judge jury and executioner of this band man huh? who the fuck are you me man. and the bass player write all the songs yeah well <laughs> yeah, yeah that that can be that way of course it it, it can and, go and when, when you're like in your early 20s your emotional maturity is not there so you're like who the fuck are you man <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it usually doesn't turn out well because everybody's like, yeah. No, but the, that whole ego and the ugliness and lack of camaraderie and everything just completely ruined what I loved about music. So I started doing record reviews and interviews because it was all about the music. Right. You know, and it might be one of the reasons why just dealing with all that extra shit just takes away from what it's all about to me you know yeah yeah i i yeah, again yeah when because whenever you got your own band even if you're again if you're part of a, another band uh you know so so after steve and i hooked up of course then the whole thing of like hey i got some demos can you come over and record it and i actually have a reason why uh it works right in with what you're talking about right now but you know so then i went over and and just laid down some solos on oh, yeah. a couple of the songs and stuff that end up being on the first funny money record and and you know his comments like hey um uh because you know I, I i think his word he was like hey i knew you could play i just didn't know you could play that well and i'm like okay well i don't quite know what that means but nonetheless so obviously he liked that so he uh he had already he already uh, got together with three other guys so it was a four piece including him to go ahead and do this new band thing and uh they they were in frederick is where they were doing the rehearsal and stuff so uh he said uh I, I or i said hey i'm gonna go ahead and either move back out to la or maybe move down south to nashville or something yeah. like that to go ahead and do something musically wise right and uh you know i just knew there was nothing for me you know, back in my hometown at that point yeah so i said if you're interested in me in any capacity for this band you know just let me know whatever so anyway so and i was getting a vocal lesson from him like you know say every monday something like that yeah and and he, and so he came back the next monday he goes hey i talked to the other guys particularly the other guitar player billy and and they they said uh why don't you have dean go ahead and come down you know this coming they were doing rehearsals on sundays so come down to frederick on sunday and uh you know we'll see what happens that kind of stuff so i was in the middle of i do remember i was in, like in the middle of playing 12 out of 14 days in a row at that point wow. and and so and you know steve knew and everything like that but he goes hey here's like five you know originals funny money tunes and then uh and then here's like five kicks tunes learn just whatever you can so of course you know, i'm, I'm going to make a good impression so i'm trying to get through everything i can so yeah. I went ahead and, and went down that went down there uh, on a Sunday. Got together with those guys. We did it uh, in his uh, in his wife's, or so I guess his brother in law, uh, in in his garage in Frederick. And so so we did it. And so whenever I'm leaving, uh, you know, he says, "Hey, you know, give us a uh, you know give us uh, a day or two. Let us talk, you know, and then I'll go ahead and I'll let you know what everybody says here in a couple of days." It's like, okay, that's fine. So by the time I drove that and drove back up to Cumberland, I got a message that said, hey, somebody named Steve called and said, you got the job if you want it. So so oh, it took wow. like an hour and a half instead of like two days. So so that was good. But that was the beginning of Funny Money. So that was in uh, that was in 96. And nice. was, so, so that band ended up basically going going on for uh, 18 years. Yeah. I, and so we had do something and you guys will do something in funny money that's how it's been for a while or it was yeah yeah well exactly and well of the course then probably somewhere around 2000 well no no not 2000 probably around 
20, I don't know, 25 or 2010, something like that. But anyway, so a couple of kicks, you know, reunion shows started, you know, kind of popping up and doing it. And then, and, and you know, and that is just built. So now they're, again, they're at the point where, or, you know, and it's probably been now going on, I don't know, three, four years now since uh, yeah. Funny Money's played. Uh, since we played our last show, just because Kix has gotten so busy. And so I think uh, some of the other guys are just like, hey, if we're not, you know, if we're not doing kick stuff, because you know, honestly, it makes really good money. So yeah. you, know, you go out and play one kick show or go out and play, you know, four or five funny money shows to make the same amount of money, uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, the desire, you know, those guys are pretty much about 10 years older than I am. Gotcha. So as long as I've been doing it, they've been doing it for, you know, probably another 10 years before that. So um yeah they i think that they're just at the point where you know they're not like hey man i just freaking want to go out and play you know, yeah i think it's more like you know, we're in a position where you know we can go out and make some good money we don't have to go out and do it each weekend and we can still survive uh that kind of stuff so that that's their you know unfortunately for funny money uh fans who who you know, really want the band to do it you know yeah uh, cause the hunger is still I, there you know <laughs> It's yeah well again i i can't do it by myself yeah so and i just don't know if there's any any genuine interest uh from the other at least probably say three other guys right now so yeah. if it happens I've, I've tried to bring it up and even just like a little one-off special thing and, and we've been offered some stupid money to go out and just do, do a private show as well and but the answer was no so yeah it doesn't thrill me you know there's no big surprise over that i've told everybody I'm willing to do it. It's fine. I think it'd be fun. And, but, but, you know, like, like you, if you write songs, I mean, well, I'll, I'll speak for myself. If I write songs, I think they're cool songs. I want to get them out and play. And it's weird to sit there and think that I wrote some songs for a band that, you know, will never ever get played again live, even though people like them. Yeah. You know, unfortunately I can't go out there and, and sing Steve songs. There's something so, in me that knows that I'll get out and play my songs live again when, you know, the time is right. It just doesn't feel the time is right. I want to release them. I wrote yeah. them. They've never been finished. I've got a great singer to go on them and stuff. So yeah, I understand. You want to get them out. You want them active. You want them out there. You want to play them for people. You want people to react to them. You want that. Yeah. You know? Well, well even some of the songs, you know, that Funny Money wrote, there's, there's uh, probably, you know, at least one or two on X amount of records you know, the, the typical, they don't get played live. They just don't yeah. fit anywhere in the set list. They're, they were just, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean that they aren't good songs, but there was just not a place for them in the set list. Uh, you know, we would usually do, you know, at least a 90 minute, you know, show all the time. Yeah. So, and it was always half and half, half kicks and you know, half funny money. So, you know, you're cutting in, the more records you get out, the less songs you can throw in the set list, stuff got to get Yeah, exactly. Out. So, all that stuff yeah. comes into play. Yeah, it keeps it interesting, you know, and, uh, you know, so even after that, so I, I, of course, just went back and, you know, started just focusing much more on solo wise and, and uh, which again is fine, you know, I'm happy with and, uh, but yeah, everything's such a just crazy, wacky, everything right now that. Yeah, it really know, is. You know, I mean, you can do all, all that stuff. You can put all your energies into it uh, yeah, or not. Right. And you feel like you're pretty much getting about the same distance. I mean, certainly. Yeah, you know, we'll look back in this X amount of time, hopefully, and go, man, remember that COVID time period? But it's already been two freaking years. Exactly. Right? You know, and it's better now than it was a year ago. By far, yeah. But, but, but couldn't you imagine, you know, whenever bands like Kiss go, uh, we can't go out and tour because what, if there's a COVID outbreak, everything shuts down. So you can't go out and tour for a week, and the next thing you're shut down for two weeks. You know, you yeah, kind of, I as went, we have known, we wouldn't have went out for the one week. I yeah, went yeah, all the yeah. way to Pittsburgh last summer. Oh, did you? Okay. To see the show in Burgettstown. All right. With my kids. My dad drove up to meet me in Pittsburgh at the hotel, you know, um, half hour before they were doing on stage. Paul tested positive, canceled, rescheduled, yeah. and I couldn't make it back within a month because it was you know, in August and they were rescheduling it for October. But, but isn't that the craziest stuff? So, so it, what's your thoughts on all this stuff? Cause I mean, we just saw it with Adele, you know, people, you can imagine how much money people spent to go see Adele out in Vegas and for her to kind of, kind of cancel it 
you know, last minute within, I don't, I don't even know what the sh things were supposed to start a week or whatever it is, but you know, you got people literally flying in from around the planet. Yeah. And all, I, all money, I'm like, and, and I mean, to me, yeah, I mean, like I said, there, there's where the whole, I feel like by this point they should have a, have well in advance notice on things like that by this point into it, this far into the problem. Well, what, what about Molly Crew, Def Leppard, Poison, and uh, Joan? Jett? You know, I mean, I'm, how many times can you reschedule something and go, no, you don't get a refund, but your ticket's still good a year from now? That's I don't even biggest, know if that's, that's the biggest load. Well, you would think it shouldn't be. I Common mean, that says it shouldn't be. But the you question is, have to is, be careful and check the fine print because, you know, me and my wife did. We got our refunds for those tickets because they weren't sure. cheap. You right, know, right. But we had to be on them for months and months before we got even a response. See? But it was right. one of those things where you have to check the fine print of when you purchase. If yeah, the, yeah, but it, but if somebody but if they say to you, "Hey, you're going to buy this ticket and sorry, uh this might get canceled." But they can't go, sorry about your luck, because everybody else got money and you don't get it. Or they can't go, well, we're going to go and reschedule it and your ticket will be good, you know, net in a month, 30 days from now. It's like, I took off vacation for this. Exactly. I'm flying in for this show. I'm not getting any of that back and I can't come back in a month. Yeah, you're Give not getting your hotel, money. your travel yeah. fare, nothing back. No, you'll, you'll get your exactly. ticket so, money back. Maybe. So I don't care what you put in your fine print. No, that's just not you have right. to read the fine print and make sure and use that against them. That's what I'm saying. When you make a purchase at that contact of sale, you are agreeing to those terms. They can't just send you a mass email saying no refunds when things change. Those aren't the terms you agreed to at the time of purchase. That's well, right. and that, that's it. I don't care if somebody goes, hey, Kiss goes on at eight and then they reach out and they go, hey, sorry, there's a delay. Kiss won't be on until 10. I'm like, unfortunately, I have to leave at 10 because I have to work the next day. So yeah. I want a refund. And they can't go, well, the show's still going on on the same day, but- They have like, to honor like, your yeah, request. But, but I didn't buy a ticket for 10 o'clock. I bought a ticket on eight o'clock. Exactly. So, you know, they, there might be a little wiggle room. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? If you have a little bit or they go, hey, it's 15 minutes, I'm sorry. It's just, but yeah, if you go, well, I'm sorry, but that jacks up, you know, my world. So give me my money. The weird thing is, I don't know why they didn't try to do it as a three piece because they did that before when Paul had a heart issue. Yeah, they did. They did. That, Maybe that it was, wasn't such a. Couldn't it, even get inside. There were people who were VIPs who were in there watching soundcheck and they were being walked out. Yeah, but you know that that three piece was just Gene. I mean, I I've done it. Uh, we we had to do it. Funny Money had to do it in the very beginning. Uh, we had a drummer that was there for, for maybe, I'm, uh, it's been a long time, but uh, maybe, maybe like six months, maybe even only three months into the band, whatever it was. And I won't even mention, I won't even mention the dead man's name because uh, he, he doesn't deserve it. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, so I, he was a great drummer and everything. And, but anyway, so we're, we're setting up at a club and we had, you know, a Friday and Saturday book. And uh, I'm sure it was up somewhere freaking in PA because uh, that's where a lot of those earlier gigs were. But anyway, so we're sitting there at the club and it's a, a Friday. Everybody else is there all loaded in, set up. It's like, hey, where's the drummer at? I don't know. Trying to reach him, trying to reach him, all this kind of stuff. Can't get a hold of him. And uh, so uh, we don't hear anything from him that night. So we end up having to cancel that gig. And we still stayed overnight. And then, of course, then we reached out, to, uh, you know, Steve reached out to the club owner for Saturday's gig. And he said, hey, here's what's going on. We can't get a hold of the drummer. You know, we can't play a show. We don't have a drummer. And the guy's like begging. It's like, man, I put so much money into this show. It's like, can you do anything, anything? So I kind of don't have to give all the money back stuff. So, so Steve actually ended up playing drums. Oh, that, wow. For X amount of songs. Because, you know, he started off as a drummer. That's so he, wild. He, yeah, he was, he was a drummer ever before he was a lead singer. So, so he did both double duty? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah just that night. And of course, so. So, uh, like I said, that that drummer, eventually somebody was able to contact him and he said this stupid story of, yeah, man, you don't know what happened. My car broke down and somebody drove up to 
blah, 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 and towed me two hours back home to Virginia uh, and everything. I'm like, uh, I don't know any tow place that's going to go, yeah, we'll tow you two hours each way. So, yeah, I, so anyway, everything he said just didn't truly didn't hold water. Yeah. And, and uh, but but there's where, hey, the, the show goes on. And if you can't do it, then why in the world should you, you know, give me my money back if you can't do the show? It just makes sense. Exactly. You know, I, don't get, I don't get it. So I don't get it either. It's weird. It's it's wacky. It's kind of scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway. So but, with so low, it seems, is it something that you have like a steady band for? that you record the albums with or do you kind of branch out and try to work with different people on the different records and just translate it live with the band because i know uh, there's many different ways you can go about it oh i i, I well absolutely and, and grant i mean i i don't mind like a little uh you know like a little guest thing here or there even though i didn't use anything on the first record i mean everything we did on the first record uh, cause we're actually only, this is only going to be record number two that I finally crank out. But again, since I'm, I'm writing all the stuff and again, that was the whole point is I don't want to have to answer to anybody else. If, if the drummer plays something that I just don't care for, I want to go, you know, I don't, I don't have to, uh, tell him what to play because I'm playing with people that I like what they do. Quite frankly, that, that's why they're, they're, they're playing in, or they're in the band, either one or both. Right. Yes. So that, that first record, you know, of course I did all the guitars uh and then uh alex hicks did the drums on that record and uh he helped me out with x amount of the backup vocals of course i did all the lead vocals and then mark schenker you know from funny money from kicks uh he did the bass and, and produced the record so nice. there's only three people playing on that and, you know if you look at the back of the record it's got got three other guys who actually didn't end up playing didn't play on that record at all but with with the new album it, uh you know it's the same thing so we got a nice solid band now uh, murray Godall plays the drums harley coon plays the other guitar and then the bassist is uh dylan house and um so all, all those guys are good and i uh, you know i plan on those guys being you know the band that goes in on the record nice. uh and does all that kind of stuff uh you know the only sketchy thing but I, you know of course having said that i would love to go ahead and do all the bass because i love playing bass yeah but, it's fun, it, but it's really? only fair to you know to dylan to go yeah, ahead and do it exactly. because he's good at it. if yeah. he wasn't very good at it i'd say dude you know i'm sorry i'm you know i'll just say you know quote my band and and even though it's a it is a democracy as far as you know everybody i'm i'm always welcome to ideas and input from everybody in the band even even the people around us all that stuff you know but somebody has to there has to be one chieftain at the end of it to make a decision yeah agreed now. yeah you know and, and uh and i have an idea and and even the guys who prior solo band members and stuff, you know, they, they've always uh, approached it and kind of commented accordingly as I came in, whatever you want to do. But of course I make sure I let them know that I do value your opinion and uh, let yeah. me hear it. if I'm missing something and tell me I'm missing something. Fair enough. Yeah. I, it, we it, walk it, on stage it, and we're a band. something else that could make this song go to the next level, you know, yeah, you want and, that and, open line of communication. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and again, I have to be happy with it at the end of the day, hopefully everybody else is the guys in the, the group seem to like the stuff that I come up with and everything. So it's all good. But at the end of the day, you know, we still have to go out and uh, it still has to be presented as it's going to sound, I guess, a certain way, just like funny money. You yeah, know, as long as Steve singing, it sounds kicks ish. But those songs, you know, most of the songs on the funny money records, don't sound like kick songs. No, they don't. You know, but but again, Steve is a very unique vocalist. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you know. I I heard him do some of those you know cover tunes like uh, "Foolin," the Def Leppard cover thing. Yeah. And I go, it sounds like Steve singing over top of Def Leppard music. And, you know, he he doesn't try to replicate. You know, Joe no. Elliott. We we did a uh, we did a cheap trick uh, tribute called uh i think it was called stiff competition so it was actually like a two disc thing uh we did alvita zane because we actually used to end our show with it awesome and, uh, yeah and, and steve did a phenomenal job on it. the whole band you know uh yeah. you know we like the song so we we tried to replicate it best we could oh and, yeah um so anyway but i think it was right before it got released i don't know if it was rick you know rick nielsen or whatever because Robin even had a tune on there, but Rick or somebody from Cheat Trick, 
uh, corporation or whatever goes, uh, no. And they basically, they, they stopped its release or stopped it after only so many of them got out. So it's, it's a, you know, it's funny whenever you go ahead and, and it's like, yeah, but, but Robin's on it. Robin actually did his own Frank Domino from angel. He's on it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we recorded somewhere, I think down, down somewhere in, in Baltimore, uh, down at Q studios, I think, or something like that. Um, but, but nonetheless, so yeah, it's just one of those things where, uh, when it comes to your own band, you know, I just know what I want and I have to walk on stage and, and, uh, and and deliver it with the uh, the comfort and the confidence that I have. Like I said, I'll never know if any of my songs are great songs, you know. But I like them and I'm proud of them enough to go ahead and let other people hear them. So it's always really weird when you again somebody comes up and goes, "Hey, I really like that song. That was great," you know. Yeah. Like cool, you know. I'm like I like it too. It's fun to play, but yeah. I don't see it as it is a great song, isn't it? You know. Yeah. So. I, I don't know why anybody would kind of listen to their stuff and, and go, <laughs> yes, it is great. Now, you, know, you can go, yeah, it is, it's good stuff, you know, but again, uh, you know, Brian May, I'm sure, you know, none of those guys ever sat around and listened to Bohemian Rhapsody. No. If anything, they probably listen to we it. Like, yeah. really up there. We made a classic record there. Going well, 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 they, they might <laughs> go, Hey, Hey, yeah, yeah. I do think it's cool and it's clever, you know, but, but they, you know, my, and I've, I've said it for years, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody to me is, the greatest song I've ever heard and certainly written in, in modern times for me, you know, yeah. just everything about it. Cause it sounds like nothing else. And it's uh -huh. like, it's almost like a McCartney thing, like band on the run. Yeah. Uh, where, where you go, you know, there's like six or seven great songs in this one song, but it tells the same story. Well, it, it, it's the big picture and you go, yeah. and, and it's cool because, you know, a tune like uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, an American wouldn't have written that because no. You know, British people grow up on all the opera and that that's that's part of their, you know, their background. The Beatles you know, started I, 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 Monty Python in the Holy Grail, for God's sakes. Pink Floyd, and, Jethro Tull, members of the Beatles and others. So yeah, you had but that even, too. But, well, even though after the Beatles got going, of course, and later in their career, when you think about Eleanor Rigby, you, oh, know, yeah. now you have all those big orchestras. And again, not a typical American thing until maybe an American band heard uh, the Beatles do it. Beatles do it, exactly. Yeah. Well, of course, Beach Boys, though, you know, yeah. you, got the whole, you got the whole Pet Sounds and Sergeant Peppers and all but that. It's weird because them and the Beatles were kind of always neck and neck for each other back then, and people forget that. Yeah. Well, wait, I and I had uh, I didn't realize, of course, yeah, because the Beach Boys obviously came out first, and they were huge on the charts. And then you hear about all, the whole thing about Brian Wilson's breakdown, you know, like uh, whatever thirty thousand feet up in the air stuff. Uh, but they said it was just because obviously he. It was this competition with the Beatles, I guess, the pressure of he had oh, to keep wow. coming up with kind of hits and back and forth. And it's just it's just weird. You, you don't necessarily even associate the Beatles and uh, the Beach Boys, you know, yeah. but the Beach Boys are probably roughly what, maybe two years before uh, the Beatles hit. Well, I mean, you don't even think about them. So the Beatles didn't hit them, but they were together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, well 64, though, because uh, I think the Beach yeah. Boys are probably 61, 62. Yeah, surfing so, USA and all that. I guess. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, they were they were number one songs, and then the Beatles come along, and guess who's battling these two bands yeah. for, for that kind of yeah. So it wasn't like the Beach Boys just went away because they kept having hits, but there if was I recall songs. correctly, when the Beatles put out Sergeant Pepper with the concept, I think the Beach Boys' response to that was uh, the party record. Uh, it was Pet Sounds. Oh, really? Pet Sounds. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure. So I guess party was later, right? Uh, well, if if I'm thinking of the correct party record, uh, then uh, that's where uh, it, party's the one that actually had like the lyric sheet in it, right? Yeah, and they have more just more just the hits that you almost like a karaoke thing. Yeah, you know, it, it was might, supposed to be like you were at a party. That was the just wait, 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 well, yeah, but I think it was actually tunes that maybe at least some of them were already hits. Possibly. So that's why I had like a lyric sheet in there. So uh -huh. it actually wouldn't have been, I guess, a, a new, new record, but there might yeah. very well have been some new stuff on there. But uh, yeah, it was, it was always the Sgt. Peppers and Pet Sounds. That was the thing. And of course, then the Stones had. Uh, uh, There's the Majesty's Request. Yeah, I can never get the name of that title right. Exactly right. That was their response to the other two responses. stuff. So. I actually really like that Stones effort. 
I've I've never I've never heard what uh what hits are on that. Uh, two thousand light years from home or something like that's a really good one on that. Uh, two thousand man. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. You, you know the you know which version I heard first too, but um, oh yeah, yeah. Well, my my mine was mine was off of Dynasty, man. Yeah, two thousand years from home or something yeah. like that. It, it's not the one on. Uh, I'm not confusing it with Goat's Head Soups a hundred years ago. Okay. Um, I I know the hits. I know the hits from the stones. That's about the weird it. thing was I always thought sympathy for the devil should have gone on satanic majesty's request, considering what they were trying to do with the satanic majesty's request. But that was kind of more towards what they did later. That made them what they were, yeah. which is interesting. But yeah, I would say their satanic majesty's request is definitely their psychedelic Sergeant pepper, whatever. Very stark and dark in contrast, I would say. Oh yeah, so it doesn't. Uh, I mean, overall, it's it sounds kind of happy in certain places, but it's not like you know. I don't know how to explain it. It's their Satanic Majesty's request. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Well, it, the name might very well say it all. It's kind of funny how two thousand man can describe modern society. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, see, I am I, having an affair with a random computer. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's. <laughs> That's true. See, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. See, but I wouldn't even have came up with a lyric like that, like we were talking about the lyrics and stuff. Yeah, I mean, either. I, that wouldn't even enter my brain, even nowadays. Now, unless I, I thought of 2000 Man, I'm like, how can I change that so it doesn't sound like I was ripping it off, but it inspires you to, to come yeah. up with something, you know, semi-related to the idea. Exactly. It's brilliant. You know? You know? It's yeah. almost like that old folk tradition of playing the same song by someone else, but changing it slightly. And then it gets passed down to someone else who, you know, there's a slight change, you know, yeah, that old tradition in a way, just yeah. reimagined, I guess. Yeah. You can well, only I mean, invent the wheel once. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah, but you can obviously, you know, you can uh, high performance it and you can do everything else. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's a wheel. You could only do so much with a wheel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, is there anything else you'd like to tell your fans? Is there any tour dates coming up? I know with the times being what they are. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we're always looking to go ahead and get gigs. We're, we're almost that little, you know, rock and roll, little gypsy thing trying to go ahead and just find anybody that will have us. You know, all that kind of stuff. You know, me me personally wise, I'm still doing a ton of teaching wise. Uh, you know, luckily again, I make my living with this thing. So uh uh but again, I'd much rather make yet, it. But I'm on my way. <laughs> there you go. Well, well again, you just you just keep plugging at it, man. That that's all there's to it. And but you know, I mean, yeah, so so I keep doing that and still working on songs and just trying to get better at this and just being a better musician so i've always kind of uh uh aspired to be uh what, even what i tell my students which is you know don't be a guitarist be a musician who happens to play yeah. guitar. So it, it's, just, it's, it's all bigger picture but you know be the best guitarist you can be if that's what you're going to be but you know make sure it's a musical uh aspect of it rather than just you know i'm not a big shred shred guy I like just just the shred aspect that's kind of not where my head and heart's at but uh mm -hmm. no so we're out there again just trying to play it and and get some stuff recorded get it out looking forward to the summer because that always yeah. opens up opportunities there's more festivals and stuff that we get booked for and and that so hopefully everybody you know but uh you know just come get on facebook and that's really about the only place that we can you know you can keep track of us and you never know we can keep track of you too but it's called friends of solo so just get on there and shoot us that little friend request to join in and we'll be happy to have you in the fold so we got a lot lots of uh lot, lot of nice people out there that you just meet at shows and you know how it is you never mm -hmm. you never know uh you play a show and that might be the only time anybody ever sees the band and that might be enough for them to go hey i live up in new york i just happened to be coming through town i was down at ram's head and saw you guys open up for kicks really enjoyed it and then from there on then a relationship starts 
Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just good all the way around. You know, you want, you want other people to enjoy what you're doing and that inspires you to keep doing it. Absolutely. You know, everything's not, you know, financially driven. If it was, then <laughs> you would see, you'd see gold records instead of, well, actually what's up behind me. So there's, there's my photo of, uh, Brian Setzer and I up there, nice. which you can't really see very well. Uh, there's my beach boys signed Ooh. a fr friend of mine works for the beach boys. So this, uh, I go see them whenever they come through town. Of course, there's the solo thing. Uh, you can't see that down there. That's my wife on the our wedding, our wedding day. Uh, that up there was uh, when we were out with Daughtry up in uh, I think Danbury, Connecticut. Something cool. Like anyway, lot lots of fun stuff. But anyway, point is, is that uh, you know, I I love doing music. I love doing what I do, and uh, I meet a ton of ton of people that I end up just being friends with uh that, that there's no other way that i ever would have came across them you know yeah i met uh, you through a mutual friend of mine <laughs> a, a, exactly exactly and i'm sure obviously you and i will uh keep in touch and oh and absolutely like you don't have to worry about that from my end so yeah you know and, and uh until kiss finally goes hey they're done then andy can go hey <laughs> we you go on to the final show you know and, just, and even wrapping it up yeah when it comes to like the whole kiss stuff i was like uh i don't really need to see kiss at the end and the long i only story. was trying to take my kids to see them one time and yeah <laughs> well, well well i mean to me and again it's uh, not to sound any which way because again i'm a huge kiss fan i have rock and roll overs right there nice. all right i got it and and i uh, i still again i'm still a kiss army member paid proud <laughs> you know they're, 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 exactly so you know it's just that you know you know how you know even if you wanted the four guys up there, you know, you and, that, and, want to. and if, if it's not uh, enough, you know, for you up there, then that's fine. You know, then, then it is what it is. You know, some people are like, man, that's not the original band. They suck. I'm like, well, it's not the original band, but, uh, they there's don't nothing that, but no, all you gotta do is freaking, you know, just listen to a recording and you'll hear that they don't suck. They're quite yeah. good, you know? Absolutely. So, but, but anyway, so I, I had went through the whole thing of like, well, you know, maybe if Paul's vocals aren't quite up to snuff, you know, you just, again, you want the best from your heroes, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's not that, it kind of makes you go, uh, you know, you, you just feel bad. You feel let down or whatever. But uh, now, yeah, whenever they come back around uh, my area and stuff, I, I definitely plan on going seeing them one more time. And that'll yeah. be my little uh th thanks for the music and all that kind of stuff so they've they've if been they're still going with the world comps the hell down and plays one more show up my way i'll take my kids to it but not until the there world comes down after that first time <laughs> that sucked having to you know my kids yeah. luckily understood but well, 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 well it's nice that they understood but it still sucked yeah because we were everybody was turning around and we were like oh everybody must be getting in it was you know almost showtime right nope cop came up you know the concert's canceled right that's why everyone's turning around if you're going to turn around i'd do it now I'm like, i i i i remember actually reading you know reading about that be it metal sludge or eddie trunk that's about the, that and blabbermouth i think or maybe maybe loudwire the are the places i i look for stuff but uh first concert I actually was going to go to of course the first one again that i did see was Kiss on Dynasty, 1979, the Gap Center. But the one I was going to go to before that was down at Meriwether, Meriwether Post. And that's a good uh, venue. I've been there a few times in my life. Yes. Yeah. Well, again, you know, uh, M3 and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I mean, I I'm not a big fan of the lawn. It's just not my deal. It's like it's too far away. I, I don't want to watch yeah. screens or, or little things that are this big. But, uh, but I remember it got there and it was freaking pouring. I mean, dumping down rain. I do remember this very well. But there's probably four of us in the car, and uh, we actually went to go see Eddie Money open up for Meatloaf. Oh, wow. that would have been that would have been my very first. So that would have been his Bad Out of Hell tour and Eddie Money's probably first record as well. Yeah. And, uh, and we got down there and it was dumping down and they said that the show is canceled. But I believe it was because they said, I think that Meatloaf was sick. So whether oh, it was wow. the weathery stuff or whatever, but I, it wasn't because of the rain, I guess. Yeah. As far as they're concerned, if it's covered, come on in, give us your money. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, That's so how that goes. Yeah, but, but you know that was all. Stock. We know health and safety don't exist. <laughs> well, well it, yeah, it is. You'll survive. You'll survive. Yeah, yeah. You you'll, like, you'll be fine. And, yeah, and how much more rock and roll do you need? I mean, come on. 
Yeah. Like this was miserable. Yeah, but it was a great show. Exactly. You'll, you'll remember both things. It was a miserable. I saw Kiss in 2004 and it started raining at Hershey Park and they still kept going. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, of course they're dry up there, but I'm just saying. Well, yeah. Well, you know, I'm yeah. just saying, like, you know, I always get to tell people, I'm like, you may have been kissed in the rain, but I've seen Kiss in the rain. There you. That's that's right. That's right. And, and they'll go, sorry about your luck. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my girl was really hot, so that's all I got to do. Yeah. So. Rock and roll never leaves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, that is true. It's all uh, inter- Well, hey, I man. guess you answered my last question, which is always, "What do you love about music?" Well, uh, just about just about everything, man. It's uh, it, it drives my wife nuts if she goes, "Hey," or I say, "Hey, what time are we leaving?" And she goes, oh, five minutes, whatever, like that." So I'm just sitting there. <laughs> whatever, I'll pick it up, and then of course she'll come walking down and. I'm still kind of playing. She's like, I said five minutes. That was that was 10 minutes ago. Are you ready to go? Okay, yes. So it but but yeah, it, it is it's just cool because it, there's you know, there's no end. Uh everybody wants to kind of get on the top of the mountains, like so you can finally get to the end of the internet, all that good old stuff. It's like there there's is no, no such end. thing. Exactly. And and that keeps it fun, it keeps it interesting, you know. Yeah, it, it, it can never uh, get stale when there's always something new and undiscovered by you. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and again, you you'll never learn everything on this. Or, exactly. Or and, and and just like with what you're doing right now, every interview, whatever, it's not the same. No. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna find at least something, uh, unless you're interviewing Joaquin Phoenix, you're gonna find something of brand new interest because I think he doesn't do a whole lot of talking, does he? Nah. Unlike me. Yeah, or me. So, so there you go. That case of fun, dude. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, this was fun, man. Um, that's pretty much it, all it was, I've got. It was months in the planning, though, wasn't it? Yes, but it, it was worth was it, wasn't months, it? Months in the planning, dude. I'm glad we finally got this done. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, awesome. man. Well, if you like what we're doing here, people, hit the like button, hit the subscribe, and leave a comment. I'm sure Dean will be poking around. Um, until next time, this is Andy Thunders on the Rock and Roll Gypsy Diaries. That's Dean Kramer. Take it easy, guys. Thank you.